Hey guys, so I want to continue on the Is It Good series where I'm going to be talking about the Turks Leoric playstyle. This is the series where I will break down competitive players to look at if their build is good for all of the players in for us in Storm League or if it's just a build that's used for a specific competitive scenario. These players all had money on the line. They took their best builds into this and they were not trying to troll anyone at any point. They are completely serious with these builds. This particular build on the Turk is one that I've told people not to go uh, primarily because there is one major problem with this build. Uh, it struggles until level 20. And that means that the way you need to play Leoric is playing to stay in the game rather than playing to win objectives and get leads. You stay in the game, you get 20, and then you win the game. I'm never a big fan of that playstyle because I always say, how many objectives do you lose before it gains value? But... Let's talk about it. Let's get into it because I can be wrong. I'm wrong just like a lot of other players in this game. No one's right on every single situation. In fact, there are two major Garrosh players that disagree on builds and I always like to bring them up as examples. Uh, Leon Black and uh, Russ, they both have very different Garrosh builds. They both say the other build is not the build to go anymore. And uh, But they're both GM number three and four. So which one is right? At the end of the day... This is a nuanced game, and it's something that everyone has their opinions on different things, so I am certainly wrong at times, and this is what I'm trying to do, is prove myself wrong here. Am I wrong that this build struggles in the early game, and it's amazing if you can make it to level 20, or is it just worth it that much, and I'm right, but it's just worth it that much to get to level 20. Let's talk about it. The Turk. So the early game, he plays rather safe. Uh, even though he does beat Garrosh, he doesn't really try to do anything crazy with it, honestly. I mean, he goes for a swing here and there. He throws a W here and there. Uh, but he really doesn't try to do anything crazy. He gets thrown into tower range quite a bit. Uh, and honestly, this is just Leon just showing what he can do on Garrosh, ultimately. But this is really how it starts off. Turk's playing safe. He's not doing anything too crazy. He's draining back some of his life. He's, he's trading pretty equally into Garrosh, which is... A little bad, I would say, because you would think a Leoric should be able to really dominate a Garrosh in a one-on-one. -on -one. But he's been thrown into tower range a few times. He's learned from that. He's adapted from that. Let's talk a little bit about his talents. Level 1, he takes Consume Vitality. This is an increased range on your Q. Sorry, this is not. This is a decreased cooldown on your Q. And you heal for 4% per hero that you hit. This talent has been picked up a few times in the Ghost Package build, so that when you end your E, you always have your Q available, and you can heal quite a bit. And it's a powerful talent, but it's usually not picked in a lot of builds, um, because Ashen Renewal is so good. However, I like the way that he's doing it, and Turk has called himself unkillable in this build, uh, when he reaches late game. And this could be a major piece why he feels unkillable is because when the fight gets crazy, he has something else that's healing him. And then when the fight is calm, he's healing off of Consumed Vitality. So we'll be able to see how impactful that talent is as this game gets going into the team fight stages. Level 4, he takes our big friend, Neil Peasants, which probably at this point should just be baseline because it's just a talent everyone has to take at this point. In order to have what you need in a solo lane as, as a Leoric player. So right here he uses a drain on the tank. Which does a lot of percent health damage to the tank. He uses E so he can get away from the AoE damage that's coming out from Kagiri on that uh, Li Ming. And then he's just going to reposition with his low health. This would be a great time to hit a fountain or hit Ashen Renewal. He does not have either. So he's simply just going to go back into lanes. And this is going to be tricky. He can heal off of Vespertine. But at the same time, trying to heal off of a, uh, a Zeratul that has enough damage to burst you is probably not the best idea. And his excuse is that he died to gain his life back because he was at about 20%. Uh, and I, I don't know if that was actually what he was planning or not. But uh, So he lets his team fight and he goes back to double soaking. And he could join his team again if he wants to or he could continue double soaking. In this case, he goes to double soaking. If he's going to lose his objective, he wants to at least keep up on experience. Remember that this form of Leoric is going for the long run. So you want to try to stay at the same experience as the enemy team, even if you're losing objectives. But he's going to focus on double soaking. Level 7, he takes Hopelessness. So, the 
level seven, you can kind of determine what build Leorix are going based off of what level seven they go. If you're going auto attack build, you go drain momentum so that you can keep up with the enemies as you're auto attacking them. If you're going the Ghost Package build, you're going to go Drain Hope's healing is increased because you're going to be entombing someone and healing through the damage that you're going to be taking and you're going to be lowering their health and you want to be healing for the most while you're lowering everyone's uh, damage. And lastly, Hopelessness is picked when you're going the March build. Why is because at level 20, if you get Death March, the final swing of, Black of, the, or of March of the Black King applies Drain Hope to nearby enemy heroes. Which means that you're going to have a Drain Hope on almost everyone that was near you at the end of your march. And you want that Drain Hope to last even as everyone spreads out away from you. Which is why you go the increased range. And so you can tell what build of Leoric's going by their level 7 talent. And at that point you can really determine how you want to try to answer it. Currently his team is down 5-0 but he is going to do whatever he can to still try to double soak to keep his team in this game. So he's just going to maybe stall out the objective a little bit. I don't believe he'll be able to win this objective. Yeah, no. Ooh. Liam jumped back in a little too early. And there he is. And he tried to go for it. There it is. Now remember that Leoric has a little bit of sustain when he's using his Drain Hope, but Zeratul does not have sustain passively, other than just the basic healing per second, which he has rather low health, so the healing per second is not going to be that high. Um, and so this is the Turk finally leaving. Uh, I, I think he probably would have been better just double soaking that whole time rather than just sitting there because... Now his team wasn't getting as much experience, but he did stall out a little bit to where his team was able to get a boss while he stalled out the objective for a little bit. So that's not bad. That gives him level 10s. Going for this objective or this camp is tricky because on Leoric, you don't do camps very, very fast. So even with Neil Peasants, it takes you a little bit. But he's positioning to where his swipe is always hitting both of these, uh, or at least he was positioning that way. Um, so that's something that you can learn from it for sure. He's taking hits from a couple of these, but not too bad. Then he backs. He wants to be full health and full mana for this objective, or he wants to head to the opposite lane and just give up the objective and go for something else. He takes March of the Black King. He loves this talent. I'm always... I, I guess I just like Entomb so much that I don't pick March of the Black King very often, but at the same time, I just never really see how extra damage or healing is going to be as impactful as, like, forcing a fight. But, he loves his talent, and he gets a ton of value off of it. There are two major ways to use March of the Black King. One is when you're going into a team, you can use March of the Black King to get into that team. Another one is to flank their backline, do a bunch of damage, slow them, and then March of the Black King through their frontline on the way back so that you can get to safety. It's a great way to take a bunch of damage and from their backline and then gain all of that life back and then be positioned safely. Both of those options certainly work and both of those options will be seen by the Turk here. He just did the first one where you go straight in their team, front line to back line using March, and you will also see the back line to front line using March. There are also flanking options in a variety of other ways, but they all kind of stem from both of those approaches, front to back or back to front. Uh, as far as hitting people, I mean, he does throw a lot of uh, drain hopes and he lands them pretty well. The only thing that I would recommend if you are seeing this playstyle and you're trying to emulate this playstyle is I still recommend trying to land a skeletal swing which makes it easier to land your drain hope and that's something that I would recommend. The better you get the more often you can just land those dry or drain hopes just right off the bat without needing to worry about anything else. So at the start of this game we are eight minutes in and they are down two and a half forts and it is looking pretty dire for their team but they are still equal on experience so let's talk about that experience for a little bit. Uh, Zeratul has been double soaking the whole game, Leoric has been double soaking the whole game and Leoric also topping the siege damage and the hero damage. So his unkillable build as what he says anyways is very tanky. So far the only death that he has is the death that it, he says was on purpose which it could be true. And uh, after that, it just comes down to how he plays. 
Um, he's going to be draining off of Liam here. He can use his E to get away. He actually uses his ult to play a little bit more aggressive. And he just stays, uh, which is pretty bold. Uh, looks like he's going to end up dying here. He misses his W, and he's going to be taken out by Zeratul. Once again, that is Liam, uh, number one North America during the time of uh, this game. And was a... And again, this is a game that real money's at stake, so people are playing pretty seriously. So this is Lior getting value out of his passive. You can see that he's cheated death for three and a half seconds. If you don't know what Lioric does, uh, Lioric has a passive that uh, when you earn a ghost, you can um, you deal no damage, but you resurrect at the place that your ghost gains all of its health back. You can gain health back faster by using Drain Hope while you're dead. Um, you can also pop Asher Renewal while you're dead. And there are a few other tricks that you can do while you're dead to give yourself some health. You cannot be healed by allies during this time, but you do have some self-healing features that you can do while you are dead. Um, that'll get you back to life a little bit faster, but remember that experience is still going over to the enemies, so dying is not necessarily a good thing, even if you have the ability to come back. Uh, some people in the competitive scene use Leoric's death to give vision to their team because you could get vision safely because you do have vision wherever your ghost is. And this is a really rough one. He may use March to gain some of his life back, but ultimately there's no way he's going to live from this uh, because Leon's going to just simply stun him, throw him, and he's going to die. However, that does give his team some time to do stuff, but overall that's just an ambush that he probably could have predicted by seeing that all of the enemies disappeared. Something that we've seen Liam predict in the past, even when the enemies weren't doing ambushes, he was still able to predict and uh, prepare for them. He's cheating death for a good amount of time, but it's not going to be good enough to stop this tribute. So, at level 13, he takes Unyielding Despair. Drain Hope's cooldown is reduced by 0.5 seconds for every 1 second it is active. If Drain Hope lasts its full duration, its cooldown is reduced by an additional 3 seconds. If we would like to see how much that actually is, is Drain Hope lasts for 4 seconds, which means that it will shave off 2 seconds of its cooldown after... Um, well, during that four seconds. So effectively, during that four seconds, it will shave off six seconds of its cooldown, followed by an additional three seconds. That'll make it have a one-second cooldown. Because it's one second is the travel time of the actual Drain Hope, this talent, if the Drain Hope goes the full duration, will have no cooldown on Drain Hope. Crushing Hope. If Drain Hope lasts its full duration, it instantly deals 15% of target's maximum health. This damage does not heal Leoric. He might use his ult right here just to gain some life. He does try to cast it, but he still dies to that burst. So, now he has the uh, the Drain Essence, which is the, the in this level, or in this uh, ghost form ability. And he's been dying quite a bit. But, despite him dying quite a bit, he was able to still be a decent distraction for his team. And we are getting closer and closer to that power spike that he needs. So this build is called the W build oftentimes. Some people call it the creepy hand build. Some people call it, uh, I mean, a wide variety of build names. But uh, it's essentially just taking the Drain Hope talents at 7. At, and again, the range 1 at 7. Drain Hope is Unyielding Despair at 13 and Crushing Hope at 16. And then at level 20, your Death March will allow you to have that big impact that you want overall the early and middle game i feel like the turk could have been playing this better uh to be completely honest the turk doesn't play a lot of heroes of storm anymore so he might just be misunderstanding the the speed that people rotate from lane to lane and that's why he's been dying so easily but at the same time uh he could simply just be playing it out as a different play style um as he's been calling out that when he dies he's doing it to gain his life back this game is the final game of the Grand Finals for CCL. If you guys didn't watch CCL in the past, um, CCL was a Celebrity Clash League. Season 1 went over great. We raised a ton of money that went to the pro scene. Um, or not necessarily the pro scene, but the scene of people playing for money, which is effectively a pro scene. Um, and so... 
a bunch of people won a bunch of money. It was really cool. It was a ton of fun. You got to see all your favorite streamers, casters, all of that. And uh, season two has already been announced for May, uh, maybe April. And so I highly recommend checking that out. And I, you just follow Heroes Hearth on Twitch and Twitter. And you will be able to see the Celebrity Clash League casted by myself and Bahamut. Uh, it was a ton of fun. And then we also had like guests that would pop in here and there. We had Trixler that popped in for a little bit. Uh, we had Matlock. We had a bunch of people. So it was a lot of fun. And season two is supposed to be even bigger. We're supposed to have, uh, I believe, more teams. It's supposed to last longer. And that means more money in the scene, more money to be made. Just all that. It's going to be a ton of fun. It, it was a ton of fun. It's going to be even more fun. But, um, but yeah, back to the game. Turk, just covering Soak. I mean, that's look at the experience, right? They're, they're down nine kills to two. And they are ahead in experience. And we can go look at the experience really quick. He's keeping them in the game. Now, remember, playing against Liam, the experience is a really big issue. But he's keeping them in this game. But they're ahead of inexperience now. And it's crazy to think that that's like all it took was just uh, trying to stay in this game as long as possible. Playing safe. Double soaking lanes. Getting camps here or there. And that's it. So he's going to continue double soaking to try to get his team level 20s when his build comes online. And when this build comes online, it is certainly a scary build. It's just a challenging build building for level 20 because this is exactly the problem that I was worried about. You have a build that is really bad until 20. Once you get 20, it's really good. But how many objectives do you lose before 20? How much are you risking losing before level 20? And that's something that you need to really value. I would say this build works better on Tomb of the Spider Queen because you have a higher chance of getting level 20. But then in Tomb is so good on Tomb of the Spider Queen because of how the map is set up. So it's really hard to give more or less value to this build on certain maps because the maps that you're more likely to get to level 20 are also maps that Entomb is so good on, which is very, very tricky. So take it with a grain of salt. I, I am a little bit biased. I love Entomb, but he has just now hit level 20. So now he has Death March. Let's see how he utilizes Death March. He, he set his whole team up to get to this spot he did a ton of hero damage, a ton of siege damage, a ton of soak. He kept his team in this game. Is this ult going to be good enough to make it worth it? He starts off with a W. W does not pay off. He does Death March. Death March's last swing hits everyone in range. He is draining off of everyone, doing huge amounts of percent health damage, draining, taking out Leon Black, getting the reset onto his W, using his E to get out. He doesn't get out, but he is able to drain a lot of health, and he opens up a good amount of space. Is that enough? We don't know. Uh, it certainly didn't look like enough. His whole team just got dropped. But that team fight started without him. Now we saw the power of that build in a 1 versus 5 situation. Let's see what the power of that build is when we're fighting in an actual team fight again. So unfortunately, the curse is going to go over to the enemy team. And this is going to lead to a really, really difficult spot for his team. 13 to 3 as far as kills go. And this is going to be a keep down, possibly two keeps down. He drains back enough to get back up alive again. He's going back to just soaking, trying to hold the lanes a little bit. Not necessarily for experience anymore, but now just to try to keep them in the game for a little bit longer. And if you can keep them in the game for a little bit longer, they're in a good spot. They are going to fight on the boss pit. Boss was being done. It's no longer being done. Now the enemy team is split. He's going to go right in, do some damage. He does a death march. Death march is only going to hit one person this time, and they're going to be able to jump away. He is going to be using Drain Hope to try to catch someone, gain a reduced cooldown on it, anything. They do a lot of damage. They take out Zeratul. They split up the enemy team, and now they're going to be going for a boss. He's going to try to zone out the enemies. He's rather low health. He might just be going to die again to gain his life back. And uh, and that's it. I mean, they, they saw the power of, of having him land that march near them. And they were like, we can't do that. So they split up. Because they split up, they were able to kill Zeratul for free. And that's the big thing. Is like, Even if this ult isn't going to get value directly, it's going to get value indirectly by splitting up the enemy team every 50 seconds. So it's almost the opposite of Entomb. Entomb forces a fight. This is almost forcing them to leave a fight. 
it's a really cool process. Now the enemies dealt with this uh, this boss invade really really well by counter engaging or counter invading the boss while they were missing someone. And now it's time for Leorg to go in. He needs to start with a slow on his Q. And he's not going to be in range to, to land a Q, but that will zone out the enemies long enough for them to kill that Garrosh. And now there are, uh, there's that boss that needs to be dealt with up at top. There's an objective, I mean, there's a boss down at bot that they own, an enemy boss up at top that'll be able to get one key. And then the next tribute is going to be a curse in favor of their team. So one of the reasons that I did like to bring up this game is because they were behind the entire game. This shows the power of this build and this playstyle when you're behind. Because a lot of times people show me videos or, or they tell me during the video, they're like, but Paradox, like, what do we do when we're behind? And this is where I want to say, guys, I'll show you games where people are behind and this is how they play it. The Turk focused on double soaking almost the entirety of this game. He joined his team for objectives, but that's about it. And when the objectives started looking bad, he left and went back to double soaking. When his team started working on soaking, he went for camps, and that was it. That's all he did in the early portions to the mid portions of this game. When he reached level 20, uh, he pretty much just jumps in every single fight and uses March almost off cooldown. And that's essentially how he plays out Leoric. It's a really cool play style. Um, I, I'm worried about doing it on a lot of maps just because if your games don't tend to go to level 20, this is a really rough build. If your games do go to 20, then this could be a pretty good build for you to try out. So for example, a lot of bronze and silver games happen to go to level 20. You may want to try this. I would prefer auto tech build in bronze and silver games, but look at this. He drains. He then gets hit by an ult and watch. He's just going to go through all of this he marches march 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 boom hits every single person on their team draining a huge amount of life from them zoning out their entire team allowing his team to safely go for the objective and he can reposition and go right back into this fight again he's full health even after fighting all five people he's gaining all of his life back against leon black and then he had no cooldown on his w he threw it out he missed uh, and then he just goes right into the enemy team once again. Uses his E, uses his Q to slow and gain 4% of his life back. He dodges one of the orbs. And this is the point where his team goes in and closes out the game. That build disrupted their team so much. And it still allowed him to safely soak for a long portion. He's going to go for a Q, a W, and the W will outheal the damage that Tatsuki will be able to put out on Raynor as well as he'll be able to finish this game. And this is the Turks Leoric. Is it good? Honestly, this is one of those where I'll probably say maybe not as good as some of the other builds, but it sure is fun. And I would say his play style's good, but his build may not be that good. It's, it's really rough in the early portions of the game. And if his team didn't save him in a couple times, uh, they would have lost this game a lot earlier. So I would say I don't know. I'm going to say they won partly because of his build post-level 20, but they lost because of his build earlier in the game. So I'm going to go with maybe on his build, but his playstyle is good. Look at his stats. Topping the siege damage, topping the experience contributed, kept his team in the game, and that hero damage was, I mean, as far as his team goes... He was able to have that hero damage because of this build, but ultimately take it with a grain of salt. So I would say playstyle is something that you guys can emulate. Build is something that you guys can meme with, I guess. Uh, but I don't know if it's the build. I, I really don't want to push this build too much. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Check out all the rest in this series. And also feel free to check out any of my other videos. Thank you.